everyone. This presentation and all discussion is being recorded. Your comments and video will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. My name is Ala Marchenko and I am the executive co-director and president of the Aurora Philosophy Institute. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Ronan Grunberg, Vice President Technology of the API, who will speak and of the topic of Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the massage, as opposed to message, Ron will explain. The discussant this evening is John Cummins, Community Affairs Director of the API. Over to you, Ronan. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Ronan, can I just uh, say something for a moment? Because sure. I want to re we want to rename you tonight, and it will become clear as the presentation uh, develops. Ronan okay. is to be referred to as Ronan Maximus for this <laughs> evening. Ronan Maximus. Okay, everybody okay. got that? All right. Okay. Um, you you, you got to let me. Uh, you didn't even let me have a word in yet, uh, John. But. Uh, uh, yes, the reference, uh, I, I do understand it. Okay, so welcome everybody and um, uh, let's begin uh, the presentation. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and you got to tell me if you uh, see the PowerPoint. Yes? Everybody seeing it? It's all good? Okay. It's perfect, Ronan. Okay, perfect. Good. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking um, about Marshall McLuhan, and the medium is the massage. Um, now you may be wondering why it's the massage, and um, I have uh, a book that I mistakenly left in the other room, which I'm going to quickly run and show you, um, and. Uh, that will explain why it's mar the, the medium is the massage. So give me one second. I'm back. So um, clearly the, uh, the phrase is the medium is the message. However, in um, 1967, Marshall McLuhan with uh, another gentleman by the name of Quentin Fiore uh, wrote a small book called The Medium is the Massage. And um, this book is a, a very short precy of his ideas uh, in uh, understanding media, the extensions of man. Um, the reason it's called the massage is because now I'm not sure whether this is true or not, but apparently, there was a mistake at the printers and he got back the proofs saying the medium is the massage. And he thought it was brilliant because um, for him, um, media is like a massage. It massages our senses. So he thought, let's just keep it. Let's keep the title, the medium is the massage. And he also liked the fact that if you take mas massage and you break it up into two words, it's mass age. So he thought that was very appropriate given the fact that we are moving into um, an electronic mass age. So uh, that's the uh, story behind the title of my presentation. All right, so let's uh, start by, um, first of all, just uh, uh, you know talking about Mar Marshall McLuhan in very general terms. So everybody knows, I think almost everybody knows Marshall McLuhan. Um, uh, you know, and everybody knows uh, the, the cliches around Marshall McLuhan. However, very few people actually know the ideas of Marshall McLuhan, what he was actually um, talking about, uh, the, the, the underlying sort of uh, concepts that drove his uh, ideas. So his aphorisms are famous and uh, we all know uh, the aphorisms there, things like the medium is the message, uh, the global village, 
hot versus cool medium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're well known. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to elaborate on what they mean and uh, you know what he's really talking about. So in the late 1960s, Marshall McLuhan was a household name, um, very popular. Um, he could be found on numerous talk show uh, uh, situations and radio programs. Um, now, one thing about that is that apparently he did a lot of these shows, not because he really wanted to, he did them because he had six children and he said he just wasn't making enough money as a professor to feed them all and live the lifestyle that he was accustomed to. So he went on these uh, TV and radio shows. And this is good for us because he's left behind uh, a canon of material that uh, is very easy to find. You just go on the web, uh, on the internet, you do a search and you can find a slew of things on Marshall McLuhan. Uh, it's not very difficult, videos and, and writings and all sorts of stuff. Okay, now, as I understand it, it's generally a good idea to start any presentation, presentation with some lighthearted uh, humor and levity. And it's not hard to do that with Marshall McLuhan. Uh, first of all, he loved humor. Uh, he was a bit of a, uh, you know, he, he liked to prod people and he, he, would, he liked to see them squirm a little bit. And, you know, it, he thought it was good to use humor to, to do that to people. So I'm gonna show you uh, one of my favorite uh, Marshall McLuhan humor spots from uh, the Woody Allen film, Annie Hall. So this I hope will get you in the McLuhan-esque mood. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and then I'll show you the clip and uh, we'll continue. Now Marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high, a high intensity, you understand, a hot medium, uh, when I as opposed to a large sock as a horseman or a tent. What do you do when you get stuck or on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why can't you I just give my opinion? It's a free country. He, he, he can give you, you have to give it so loud. I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. Really, I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan will have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so yeah, just let me, let me, let me come over here a second. Oh, I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. Okay, so... Uh, I love this clip as well. Um, one of the interesting things, I've, I've watched the clip, um, you know, a number of times. And I, obviously, I watched it when I went to see this film originally when it came out. And um, I was very young then. Anyway, I, I did watch the, fil the film a couple of the, or the clip a couple of times. And, and I, didn't, I don't really understand what McLuhan means by, you know, you don't understand my fallacies. I don't, I don't really understand that. I, you know, I heard it. And if somebody can tell me what he means by that phrase, uh, I would love to know. Um, now, one explanation for it might be that, uh, as I understand it, Woody Allen would just have his actors improvise. And I can see how he might have had McLuhan there. And he said, you know, you're going to basically talk against this guy who's uh, talking about, you know, teaching your, your stuff and, uh, you know, just improvise something. But, you, you know, you don't like him. You know, you, you think he's not a very good teacher. So I can just see Woody Allen uh, telling him to improvise, he improvised, and Woody Allen was a first take sort of guy, you know, we'll just do it once and then we'll, we'll go with it. And I, I, I presume, I imagine that this might be the case here. Uh, okay, so uh, let's just uh, put on the slides again and we'll continue. We'll have a number of clips as we go along. All right, um, so
Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a book written later on by uh, Douglas Copeland uh, where he used the line in the film, you know nothing of my work as the title of his uh, book. I have the book actually on hold at the library and I'm looking forward to reading it because it's apparently quite a good book. Okay, uh, McLuhan, uh, just a little bit of a background on him. So McLuhan started off as an engineering student and he changed majors and ended up with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He continued his education and earned a Master's of Arts degree in 1934 in English. Uh, after that, he pursued uh, a degree at Cambridge in 1936, and he completed his master's there uh, in 1939 to 1940. So he basically had two masters as I understand it. And then he began working on his doctorate. And he was awarded his um, Doctor of Philosophy degree in December of 1943. In the early 1950s, McLuhan began the Communication and Culture Seminar at the University of Toronto, and that was funded by the Ford Foundation. And uh, at that time, he also published his first major work, The Mechanical Bride in 1951, in which he examines the effect of advertising on society and culture. Between 1967 and 1968, he was named the Albert Schweitzer Chair in Humanities at the Fordham University in the Bronx. He stayed there for about a year, and then he returned to Toronto, where he taught at the University of Toronto for the rest of his life and lived in Witchwood Park, which is basically an upper class neighborhood near Bathurst and Davenport. And one thing about uh, living in this area, uh, apparently, he loved the park there, uh, which uh, was kind of in, in the middle of the city, and he would love to go there uh, during spring, especially, as I understand it, and watch all the flowers uh, blossom and so on. And, um, um, you know, to the extent where he apparently even canceled a couple of uh, 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 tours uh, that he had because he didn't want to miss uh, springtime in this, in this park. Anyway, um, in September of 1979, uh, Marshall McLuhan suffered a stroke, which affected his ability to speak. And uh, the University of Toronto, uh, at this point, actually uh, wanted to close his graduate uh, studies program. Um, and the reason they wanted to do this is because even though he was really, really big in the uh, late 60s and up to the mid 70s, um, I was surprised to hear that by the late 70s, his status waned significantly to the point where um, he only had apparently six students join uh, one of his courses uh, towards the late 70s. So six students actually signed up for the course. In any event, they did not shut down uh, the program because there were a number of people who protested, quite a number of people who protested, including uh, Woody Allen, uh, apparently, although his involvement, I couldn't confirm 100% that he was involved. I read in a number of places that he was involved, but I didn't uh, fact just check this completely, but I decided I would put it in there. Uh, and it would be an interesting thing if he actually did get involved in um, you know, protecting his uh, School of Graduate Studies. Okay, uh, his major publications, uh, The Mechanical Bride, Folklore of uh, Industrial Man, 1951, The Gutenberg Galaxy, 1962, Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, 1964, The Medium is the Ma Massage, 1967, War and Peace in the Global Village, 1968, From Cliché to Archetype, 1970, and then the global village transformations in the world life and media in the 21st century, 1989, 1989. And that was a posthumous publication. Now, the reason that I've got understanding media, the extensions of man uh, highlighted, bolded, is because my talk here is really fundamentally going to be around that uh, piece of work. 
Okay. Now, um, before we go on, I'd like to have just a quick discussion um, as a group. Uh, given that much of what McLuhan talks about has to do with technology and the fact that most people have an opinion about technology, I thought that we'd start with a bit of a discussion first on these questions. Um, so let me just read out the questions. What is technology? How has technology changed your life? Can you live without technology? Is technology good or bad? Is there a specific technology that you get excited about? Does technology make your life easier or harder? If you could go back to an age without technology, would you? Could you? And finally, does media technology control us or liberate us? Um, now, before I open up the floor to uh, a discussion on these questions or anything else that you might want to say, uh, I just got to tell you that John Cummings and myself have had uh, a number of really um, vigorous, let's say, discussions on uh, these issues. And um, we don't entirely see eye to eye on uh, technology. So uh, throughout this presentation, John and I are going to go at it with each other a little bit, and then we'll open up the floor to um, you know, other people joining, joining in in the conversation. Um, but I will tell you my position on these uh, issues, but I'm going to start by inviting John Cummins to uh, give us a bit of his take on technology. Clearly, you can't answer all these questions, but pick, you know, your favorite one or two. And uh, Allah, I'm going to ask you a favor. This whole discussion is not going to go on for more than 15 minutes. So you got to keep track. And at 15 minutes, you got to stop us uh, in our tracks, okay? No matter what anybody is saying, because we got to go on. So, John. Thank you for a trust, Ronan. You're welcome. My pleasure. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak, Ronan Maximus. Um, yeah, I mean, Ronan, because Ronan has such a high level of cognitive thinking and reasoning power, he can surf technology, use it, use it for the benefit of himself. However, I think uh, for the rest of us, people like me, uh, technology can have a really kind of an ill effect on us. It, uh, it's like I talk about this technological ape, like when, when Eve decided to eat that apple. I mean, that was a brave thing to do. She said, I'm leaving the savannah. I'm no longer going to be an ape. I'm going to be a human being. I'm going to understand the world. I want knowledge. And that's fantastic. That's what makes us all humans. And that's the fantastic thing. But you're, and then you use your imagination. You use your awareness. You create tools. And these tools have a profound effect on us. Like McLuhan says, they become extensions of us. And I think... Ronan, you're one tenth of one percent of the population. The way you, you know you're, you you have a great ability to reason, to think through things, to not allow things to consume you. To these mediums and these messages are coming at us so fast and so furious that most people, I see, I see it in, in the people I employ. They're freaking, they're dumbfounded. Their mental health is just sinking, and I be, I believe it's because of the the, 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 the mass amount, it's, it's the volume of the messages, the volume of the mediums. I mean, they lose their phone for five seconds and they're in a panic. Well, yeah. I, I'm seeing this with 50 year olds now, if they, lose the, if they don't have their phone for two seconds, where, where, where's my phone? What's, what's happened? Okay. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. Okay. So I do, I do yeah, I'll stop there. I do yeah. think it's having, uh, for most of us that haven't got the cognitive reasoning is having an ill effect on us and it's, yeah. and it's hurting us. Okay. So thanks, John. Like, you know, first of all, I, I don't disagree that uh, technology can have a negative 
cognitive impact. And, and Marshall McLuhan would agree with you completely, but he has a solution to that, which I will get to uh, later. However, I would also suggest that um, technology has the ability to um, bring things to us and allow us to do things that really benefit us in, in many, many ways. But like everything else, uh, technology is a double-edged sword. Um, if it's taken to extremes, it can be very dangerous. It can be very hurtful. It can uh, be addictive. It can numb you. It can uh, do things that we don't want the technology to do. And uh, I am completely with you uh, about uh, how technology can be a very negative thing. I'll, get, can I, I'll give you one story quickly, and then I'll open it up to the floor. When I was teaching um, high school, I remember one day I had a student, um, you know, on the phone, she was texting. Um, and this was um, a, a history course that I was teaching. She was texting and um, I was getting very annoyed because I was seeing her text and I was thinking she should really be listening to me talk. And so I uh, called her on it. I said, you know, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm doing a talk right now. You should be listening and taking notes. She looks up at me and she says, I am taking notes, sir. I'm taking notes on my phone. And, I, and she said, you want to see what she, you want to hear what she just said in the last uh you know three minutes she read off everything that i was saying in class perfectly she was using her phone to take notes um and it was easier for her because she could organize them you know she could um categorize them she had a whole system that she set up and um it worked for her and it was much better than taking notes on a piece of paper so yes, technology can be bad, but it can also be very good. All right, so I said enough. Let's open up the floor and let's have other people um, tackle some of these uh, questions, perhaps. Uh, so put up your hand and, and then we can... Uh, Michael. Uh, hey, hi, it's Michael. And that's, uh, nice to be here. Um, from my personal point of view, I think technology is really hard to say is good or bad. I think that this question is not a correct question because technology comes from our human beings. But I think here there's a one word we need to be careful. We call it the alienation process. So that means uh, we, we are part of technology and also technology also part of us. So that process, the alienation we call them, that's human beings, you know. So we created tools and tools impact us. It doesn't matter if it's in technology, it doesn't matter if it's kind of like a knife, whatever. So they will train you out too. It's already part of our life. So we couldn't, uh, uh, how say, we couldn't, um, but technology already in the world. So we are, we are already in the process of alienation. So that's uh, too late already. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I would definitely agree that it has the possibility to alienate. Uh, Graham. Thanks. Um, I would just like to add to this conversation um, some historical perspective, which is that these questions have been raised in the history of philosophy over and over and over again. Uh, one of the spots that you see and that I think is um, central to the canon and still really interesting to investigate is in Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality, uh, at the beginning of the second part, he talks about technology as um, involving a kind of trade-off. And when he's talking about technology, he means like just the invention of, of uh, beds and shelter and anything that takes us beyond our pre-tool using selves and says with every uh, convenience that we give ourselves, like sleeping on a bed as opposed to the ground, finding something to cover ourselves with, building a shelter so that we're not wet and cold at night, um, with every convenience that we give ourselves, it's not long before that convenience talks into a necessity, turns into a necessity, and we weaken ourselves. Um, uh, uh, when I teach my students this, I use the cell phone example. Um, I ask them, you know, is there some technology that at first was uh, a great convenience and fun to have, and that now you can't imagine your life without? And they all know that I'm leading them to say cell phone without much effort. 
Um, and, uh, and I don't know, that seems like it, like an insight to me that, um, um, that the kinds of beings we are and the kind of world that we live, we give ourselves these needs. We might do better not to create these needs, but then they become needs. Um, uh, and the, the point that I just am most eager to raise is that this is um, something that folks have been thinking about for uh, at least hundreds of years, but I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if you go back to Aristotle, Plato, you could find something in the in the ancient Greeks concerned with this uh, idea as well. Yeah, I, yeah, and I would say, you know, uh, from my reading on it, um, the ancient Greeks saw technologies very similarly to McLuhan in that it's supposed to extend something in us. It's supposed to enable us to do something that we can't otherwise do make our hand better, uh, make, make us stronger or, or something like that. So, um, uh, and it becomes uh, inevitable that it, once we uh, use the technology enough, it will just become uh, a need rather than, than a want. Um, Shashir. Thank you, Ronan. Uh, beautifully done job so far, I'm very impressed. Uh, the sense of humor obviously catches all of us. Having said that, having said that, it's, it's wonderful that we are discussing technology. And uh, you, of course, uh, alluded to the fact that tools are also technology. And ever since the beginning of human existence, we've constantly been evolving, utilizing our tools, our hands, our whatever extensions we have are part and parcel of technology. But if we accept both of these things as being part of the media, of how we interact with our people around us. I'd say a couple of things. Number one, once we know what tools and technology are to us, we have to make that, that line comes to mind. First, we make our habits and then our habits make us. It's an interactive process. So when people say I like or dislike technology, it's really become part and parcel of you, as you mentioned with the girl with the telephone. It was an extension of her. And if it wasn't for the extension of these computers, I couldn't remember half the things I know. So, so it has really become part and parcel of a human existence. But as you well mentioned, it comes, it's a double-edged sword. And it comes with unintended consequences, which we've seen, especially in the recent past, how technology has been abused to the point that we don't know what truth is anymore. So I can certainly see some of the pros and the cons of it. But I think so far, this is a very good, uh, good uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shashir. Um, Aaron, um, you're, you're next. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can I be heard? Yes, you can. Loud and clear. The tech is working. This is very nice. Um, so with, uh, with regarding the first question, what is technology? I, it, it has been already touched upon, and it's Nice to see that we're not solely focused on things like electronics. Um, uh, but I sort of want to jump to question three and four, sort of uh, the idea of living without technology. Uh, and uh, philosophy is not something I extensively study, but it is something I'm interested in learning. And I sort of wonder uh, if if society today can sort of live without technology and i and i do mean including tools and such uh, because a lot of people may identify bows and arrows as being excluded from the the, the term but uh, how would we hunt for food and, and such but i am also curious to see back in the day when we didn't have things like that even i'm not entirely sure how the first humans necessarily hunted without tools and that would be kind of interesting to read about um for for number four is it good or bad um again medication i find medication to be very helpful um but i think this sort of depends on the person i think you can ask the same person to answer this question and they can give a different answer depending on whether they're looking from inside an organization or or they're looking in from out. Um, and I, I guess I can't really elaborate on that, but I, I think it's a very interesting question. I'd like to hear some other input on it. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Aaron. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the, the question of uh, is technology good or bad, it's a, 
a, a question that's a little unfair because, um, you know, it really depends. Um, and that's something I'm gonna talk about in more detail um, later in the presentation. So this is just a bit of a warm up. And, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, this is actually something McLuhan does talk about. Um, when we think about technology, we think about modern technology, el electronic, electric technology. Um, but of course, everything that we use, including a rock that we pick up from the ground is in McLuhan's um, terms, technological, because it's an extension of us. It's doing something for us. Um, so Leslie, you're next. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, when I took a look at your questions here, I think what uh, permeates a lot of those questions is the issue in regards to freedom of choice. We seem to be having fewer and fewer opportunities to have choice when it comes to the use of technology. Well, in the early days we had choice. Now it seems that basically we have to use the technology and in, in some cases, very limited cases. Uh, privacy, you know, we have no choice around that. You want to use the technology? Well, you got to give up your privacy. There's no choice in the matter. You want to do banking? Well, I'm sorry, but the pen and quill days are over with and now you have to do everything electronically and, and you lose your your uh, sense of independence and in making choice. So I, I, I really wonder how technology is affecting the mindset in regards to feeling that you're powerless in an environment where things are being basically imposed on you if you want to survive in this society. Anyway, that's the kind of general theme. That I'm sure we can elaborate more, but you get the sense. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, um, and I think that uh, the underlying uh, sort of potential malevolence of technology um, is, is, uh, is an important uh, uh, ethical and moral concern, um, which uh, we'll actually talk about a little more later. Um, Howard, let's not. Ronan, yeah. excuse me. I think Harvard has to be the last one in this yes. part of discussion, and then we yes. go back to you. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Um, I was going to say I've managed. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, um, I was going to say I've managed to do without a cell phone so far, but it's getting increasingly difficult to do things like, uh, um, you know, access a, a parking meter or buy a stop or rent a car. So I kind of sympathize with the last speaker's point about. Um, the question of choice and also the question of power relations. It seems like whoever controls the technology, um, there's a tendency for concentration, for power to be concentrated in the hands of those who control the technology. So if you look at, um, you know, social media platforms and algorithms, um, in some ways we become objectified by the con those controllers of technology. So we do have some ability to you know, express ourselves and put out messages, but the environments in some ways created for us and the, the types of messages that we receive or the type of um, um, informational environments that we exist in are determined by, um, you know, the controllers of the technology. In terms of uh, good or bad, I think it's really hard to uh, answer that question sort of generically. I think we have to ask ourselves in what ways are specific technologies, you know, more hurtful or more beneficial. So, you know, landmines versus agriculture or penicillin. Um, so it really comes down to sort of case by case basis. And there are a lot of difficult cases in which there are lots of benefits, but also lots of potential da uh, dangers to um, any given technology. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, um, uh, the very in insightful uh, ideas. We'll, I'm sure, talk more about them uh, as we go along. Okay, so I'm just going to present the key um, ideas in understanding media. This is basically the structure of it, uh, or his 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 uh, sort of uh, uh, key uh, ideas there. So the medium is the message. Basically, the argument there is that it's not the content of any medium that matters. What McLuhan is very interested in is the underlying form that determined the content. And he goes back to that again and again and again. He says, it's not the content. We can't look at the content. If we really wanna control and understand media, we, un we have to understand the 
underlying essence that makes it what it is. So that's the first uh, key idea. The second key idea is that we're shifting from mechanical technology to electric technology. Uh, so mechanical technology would include things like wheels, roads, the printing press. And those things influence us in ways that are very different from electric technology, uh, such as the light bulb, television, uh, the internet. Mechanical technology is different from electric sl uh, slash electronic technology. Okay. Now, mechanical uh, technology, he says, this is a key idea, detribalized humans. In the sense that if you consider the printing press um, and um, the publication of, of books, it brought us inward. It made us introspective because, you know, it's something that you do alone. So, you know, unlike the oral tradition where we're in a more tribal state with mechanical te technology and especially uh, the publication of books, it made us much more individualistic and much more introspective. So mechanical technology, technology detribalized humans, but electronic technology, says McLuhan, is retribalizing retribal, humans. And this is something that we're going through. It's like a paradigm shift uh, for McLuhan, and it causes stress in the way that we interact with one another. So one of the key ideas there is that we don't understand the uh, underlying uh, mechanisms that are causing these stresses. And it's very important, he says, to understand those underlying um, st structures that are causing the stresses for us to actually control them. Okay, so that's the basic outline. Let me just go into a little more detail. So one of the central ideas for McLuhan is the notion that the medium is the message. But with this concept, he's not saying that the content is important. The content is not important. He says this again and again and again. The content of media is not what is really important. Instead, what we need to focus on is the underlying form of the medium because the underlying form determines its content, its effects. The underlying forms determine the effects of medium. He says, the medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is of any extension of ourselves, results from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. So every new technology has social consequences. Any medium affects our senses in a particular way. And it's something that we need to understand because every new technology will do this to us. So in essence, what McLuhan is, McLuhan is proposing is that uh, medium, the technology, not the content that they carry that should be the focus of study. Um, because it's the medium that creates an environment, okay? The medium create, creates an environment that is all pervasive. And because it's all pervasive, it becomes transparent. Um, an analogy uh, that I've heard him use is the idea of um, the experience that fish have in water. They don't recognize the fact that they're in water because they're in, in water. Um, it's so all pervasive that they have absolutely no awareness that they're in it. Now, what he will say later is that we need to have awareness. That's the point. We have to have an awareness that we're swimming in medium, in media. Um, because the form of media is so pervasive, um, it is the characteristics of the media rather than the content that should be our focus. We need to understand it. We need to see the water. Um, 
the effect doesn't come from content. A lot of people focus on the content. They say, oh, this is bad content. It's, it's you know, morally questionable. It has a, an impact on our psyche, blah, blah, blah. He says, no, don't worry about the content. The content will take care of itself if you understand, understand the underlying forms. Um, every media changes the perceptions of society. So TV, radio, internet, they all have different effects. They have profound effects. To understand media and its effects, one needs to understand the underlying structures. I said it again, uh, I won't say it anymore, but it's a really fundamental part of uh, McLuhan. Okay, now a key idea uh, is that media are an extension of ourselves. He writes, it is the persistent theme of this book that all technologies are extensions of our physical and nervous systems to increase power and speed. Now, this means that anything that is an extension of ourselves is a type of media. McLuhan's approach makes media and technology more or less synonymous terms. So a media is anything that extends our capabilities as humans. It's a type of expression. The wheel extends our feet. The phone extends our voice. Television extend our, extends our eyes and ears. The computer extends our brain. Electronic media extend our central nervous system. Again, in his own words, any extension whether of skin, hand, or foot, affects the psychic and social complex. Language for McLuhan is a medium and a technology, but unlike other types of technologies, language does not require any physical object outside ourselves. Essentially, language is an extension that enables externalizing our inner thoughts, ideas, and feelings. So language is an extension of consciousness, but it, it's a technology. So every media or technology, regardless of what it is, extends our capabilities. Every tool, technology, and communication system by which human beings interact with each other is significant to what we become. There is a symbiotic relationship. And while we create technology, technology kind of interacts with us and recreates us. It's not a one-way sort of uh, path. Technology changes how we think, and how, how we respond to one another and how we interact with uh, the world around us. Now, one of the concerns that people often have with new technologies, especially mass media technologies, is that these technologies are gonna impact us negatively. And McLuhan was very much aware of this concern that people have. However, for him, technology is just something that exists. It's a matter of fact. Uh, we're born into it, and there's not much that we can do about it. When, when he was on TV talk shows, and the host tried, tried to, uh, uh, and this would happen often, more than once, but he would often be, you know, be asked things like, do you think television is a bad thing? He would refuse to moralize about it. He simply said, it is what it is. It's there. And we're not going to be able to get rid of it. It's going to be there. Moralizing doesn't help. He also said that technology is something that continually evolves. And it evolves in unpredictable ways. You know, if you take a look at um, old science fiction films, um, you see flying cars and all these technologies that really never came to pass. 
Um, because of course we don't need flying cars. We have digital technology. We can go wherever we want, like have a Zoom meeting like this. We don't have to have a flying car that will take us somewhere fast. We can get there instantly by virtue of digital technology and the internet. So technology takes a path that is unpredictable. Even um, people who predict the future and, and technology, what technology might, might happen in the future, oftentimes get it wrong. Okay, so the big concern is new media. Um, technology has been around for a long time, spoken word, written word, but new media is uh, something different because its scope is much more extensive. Um, so the new electronic technologies have had an unprecedented impact on humanity because they elevate the process of technological extension to a new level of significance. He, he says, whereas all previous technology, save speech itself, had in effect extended some part of our bodies, electricity may be said to have outered the central nervous system itself, including the brain. And when we look at the internet, you know, we can certainly see that how uh, that may have come true. So pre-electric extensions are explosions physically in an outward direction, but electronic technology is an inward implosion toward a shared consciousness. The internet is a kind, you know, he, if he saw the internet, he would say, we're getting very close to that a kind of shared consciousness. Our new electric technology that extends our senses and nerves in a global embrace has large implications for the future of language. So the implications have to do with the speed with which we can extend ourselves. One example um, from the mid 1800s is the telegraph. Before the invention of the telegraph, it was necessary to move information physically outward via mail from one place to another. But with the telegraph, all of a sudden, information that would take weeks to get from one place to another could now be sent in minutes. Uh, and this flow of information has accelerated multifold with the internet. So the internet and social media has made it possible for us to do things that were barely imaginable 50 years ago, like access online libraries and encyclopedias, visit virtual art galleries, access news archives, online learning, exchange knowledge and education, uh, collaborate, uh, you know, uh, work uh, when we do our work, visit doctors online, have social connections in distant parts of the world, watch movies whenever we want to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, McLuhan even seems to suggest that governance are, is, a, is a remnant of the mechanical age and that eventually governance may morph into more global political systems that are more in line with the electric age. Um, whether that's true or not, you know, anyone, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess. Um, so, this is the idea, of course, that we're kind of moving in the direction of a global village because of technology. Um, so for McLuhan, the electric age represents the extension of consciousness, and it is a global extension. Um, and this is something that he has mixed feelings about. He's not, you know, taking a panacea kind of uh, approach on this. He has mixed feelings. He says, rapidly, we approach the final phase of the extension of man, the technology simulation of consciousness, when the creative process of knowing will be collectively and corporately extended to the whole of human society, much as we have already extended our senses and nerves by the various media. Whether the extension of consciousness so long sought by advertisers for specific products will be a good thing is a question that admits of a wide solution. So he's putting forward here the possibility that we will be manipulated by media and corporations and advertisers. And he's questioning whether this is going to be a good thing. 
He goes on to say, with the arrival of electric technology, man has extended or set outside himself a live model of the central nervous system itself. To the degree that this is so, it is a development that suggests a desperate suicidal auto-amputation, as if the central nervous system could no longer depend on the physical organs to be protective buffers against the slings and arrows of outrageous mechanisms. I think what he's proposing here is the possible loss of identity, self-identity in this miasma of media technology. So this is his more dystopian sort of uh, look at technology, but he also has uh, a positive outlook on occasion. He says, might not our current translation of our entire lives into the spiritual form of information seem to make of the entire globe and of the human family a single consciousness? I think he posits this as a positive potential. Okay, so I'll have more to say on this, uh, this sort of value um, uh, position that he takes on technology. But before we do, but before we go on, what I'd like to do is have a bit of another uh, conversation with everybody. Um, John Cummins and myself are going to start it. Um, so what I'm going to play here, I'm going to role play. I'm going to role play uh, Marshall McLuhan and John is going to play Malcolm Muggridge. And I'm going to show you a very short video on which this um, interplay is going to be based on. I'm going to play about three, four minutes of it, uh, and then we'll have a, I think, 10 or, or so minute uh, conversation on it. So let me just stop the sharing and I'll show you the video. Just give me a second here. Okay, there we go. Well, for heaven's sake, this present time we're moving into this electric age is the dawn of much the greatest of all human ages. Well, there's nothing to even remotely resemble the scope of uh, human awareness and human... No, no, there, there, we, there we are. A value judgment. You know, I don't know. This is quantity, Marshall. Most First people make their judgments in terms of quantity. Now, I'm, that's, uh, I, I'm merely saying quantitatively, this is by far the greatest human age. Uh, what uh, further evaluations would you wish to have uh, brought to bear? Well, well I thought yeah, when you said greatest, you meant finest. That is, oh. that would be oh. more admirable than oh. the Renaissance. Well, I mean, uh, you mean well, the biggest? Well, uh, yes, we're a thousand times greater than the Victorian age. In size. In size. But not in quality. I don't know. You don't know. We may not, yeah. we, you know, there might be some way. I mean, let's say if there is a good lawyer, it's possible he might measure these ethics. So I have a uh, a handful of air uh, appeals to him. In other words, he, might, he might take a handful of air and one epic and say, marvelous air. Yeah. He might take out of art air and say, you know, all the beetle exhaust. Contrary to what Marshall was so brilliantly suggested in all his writing, I think there are absolute standards in this thing, culture, in art and literature, and that uh, these standards you can measure one age against another. And that we happen to have lived, no greatest fortune really, we happen to have lived in what amounts to a dark ages. We're a highly integral civilization, uh, and this is what distresses people who belong to the old specialist, disintegrated one. They, they can't find a little place for themselves. But are you sure, you see, are you absolutely sure that this is the birth struggle of a new Oh, yeah. Are you absolutely sure that it's not just the breaker? Uh, no, they're not just the breaker. Still. See, that's what I think is perhaps the whole difference between North America and Europe, really, is that you over here do believe that. Oh. But you do, you do. Over here. You have a bigger stake in the old technology. Well, no, but we, 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 we are very kind to think that all these things that you imagine to be of such enormous importance like, for instance, this thing we're doing now on our television, because a lot of people group at television for hours every day. You're inclined to think that's an enormously important thing. And I just think it's a sort of sign of the kind of vacuity that comes when a civilization breaks, like the circus is in Rome. If it had been a Marshall McLuhan 
then, you see, Mc Caius Marcus Macunibus, <laughs> he <laughs> would have written that great book about the circuses, and he'd have said, how is this new civilization coming? There's no medium. No, they had no new technology. Uh, the, um, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, but Caesar, by the way, educated the Gauls uh, by war. As, uh, this is the approved uh, Western method of educating uh, banquet areas is warfare. And uh, uh, Alexander the Great did it that way. Uh, uh, Napoleon, I was reading a book on the Russian Revolution the other day in which the author was explaining enthusiastically that the great forward thrust in Russian institutions came from the Napoleonic invasions mm -hmm. and then from the Crimean War. What is happening in the Vietnam now is a great educational forward thrust from us on the war front, on the war path. It's very pleasant to think of it that way. I don't think, I don't, I think it's a horribly, you know, it's like roast pig. You know what Charles Lamb's theory of roast pig? You like yes, roast yes. pig? Burn your house down. Burn your house down. <laughs> okay, I think we got the general uh, gist of the clip. Um, in essence, Mugridge is not uh, pro technology, communication technology. Um, I did notice that somebody put uh, a message here. Um, I think we're talking here about information technology rather than technology. This is on the message board here. Um, so I just want to quickly say that McLuhan thought that every technology is a kind of information technology. Every technology sent a message of some kind or another. It didn't, it didn't matter what technology we're talking about. Even technologies that are not explicitly uh, based on media are still technologies that send a message. Anyway, um, so let's have um, a little sort of uh, debate here based on the Mugridge McLuhan uh, discussion, if you can call it that. Now, John, I'm gonna let you have the floor first. But I want you to uh, take on Mugridge's uh, accent as well. That's a oh, I can't I, I, necessary. I, I can't do that. Uh, okay, all right. I'm just. I'm not, I've, got, I've got that. I've got that uh, stage <laughs> stage acting in me. But Ronan Maximus, you are so du duplicitous. You're sitting oh, there. Am I? Yeah, absolutely. You, Ronan, love art, love the mechanical age, love reading love reasoning. You love all that stuff. You love culture. Muckridge is talking about culture and culture matters. And he sees these mediums as destroying culture. And you know they're destroying culture. You know they're destroying a high civilization. And we're, gonna, we're entering into a lower civilization, siloing, uh, people no longer learning to reason. The book, book reading helped people reason. This, 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 this thing here, is destroying our cognitive abilities, even our memories. I got kids at work. Well, I used to remember 50 jobs at a time, 50 customers, be able to know what parts we need, what this, is. now I gotta hire five people to, to do it. And they still don't know. They don't remember what they had for breakfast. The culture is, is we're losing the culture, Ronan. You know we're losing it, but you're well, pretending to be this huge fan of technology and how it's making us better and all this kind of stuff. It isn't. It, maybe for you it is because you're able to navigate it. You don't even watch TV, correct? I don't think Marshall McLuhan watched TV either. He loved being on TV and being the court jester, but he, he didn't respect the medium. He knew it was, it was profoundly affecting us and changing us. Your lecture says that. The mediums do change us. Yes. I'm, with, I, I'm with Aldous Hux, Huxley in Brave New World that these things – are all this mass amount of media, mass amount of messaging. McLuhan doesn't give enough credit to messaging. Messaging is affecting us as much as the mediums. Okay, well, I need to respond to this. I need to respond to this because uh, first of all, um, my name isn't Ronan, it's Marshall. But secondly, um, I think that you're uh, missing the point here, John. Uh, it is true that te technology, any technology, uh, can be uh, extremely bad for you. And I would agree that uh, people um, do get numbed by technology. So when you point out that people overuse the cell phone or they overuse uh, television, I agree with all of that. But my point is that 
we need to understand the technology in order to make good use of it. That's why I wrote my book, Understanding Media. If we understand the power that technology has over us, we will be able to deal with it. The problem is we don't have a proper understanding of it. People still use technology and worry about the content. They don't have enough of an understanding of how it actually works. And that's the problem. So you're absolutely wrong, John, when you think I think of technology as a panacea. I do not. Technology is a double-edged sword. The reason I wrote the book, understand well, as Marshall McLuhan, I wrote the book, Understanding Media, um, The Extensions of Man, is because I wanted to point out that we don't have to be victims of technology. We can be masters of technology. And that if we take that position, we can use it to our benefit. Okay, let's open up the hey, floor. And let, but one sec, Ron, let me say one thing. Yeah, sure, yeah. You, you expect way too much from people to be able to navigate through these mediums. I, I relate this to like existentialism. You're expecting people to create their lives, to do this, do that without the use of, you need belief systems. You need positive mediums to do that. For most, the most people, not you, but most people, most people aren't Sartre. They just aren't. They think that we all are, you're dreaming. So we need good structures. Yeah, what structures we need that is create positive, that will create human flourishing as Aristotle would say. And I'm telling you, this barrage of mediums and messages that we got right now ain't are not is not creating human flourishing for you maybe but one tenth of one percent of the people it is and my what we need what we need john is more education on how to properly use uh media and uh that i think would make a big difference uh to a lot of the concerns that you have about it but let's open up the floor and uh see what other people have to say Sh uh, sherman oh ronan if you look at marshall McLuhan's book understanding media talks about the myth of Narcissus yes. and where uh, the uh, boy is enchanted with his image, yeah. which is uh, an extension of himself. And eventually he falls into the pool and drowns. Yeah. And so doesn't McLuhan make the point that our infatuation with technology will eventually lead to death? It because can. that's essentially the point he's making in the myth of Narcissus. Yeah, no, it can. I, I think that McLuhan does uh, see the potential hazards of technology where we become so entranced uh, with it that we lose sight of ourselves in a, in a way and uh, it, it kind of takes over us. But he does have, I believe, an antidote to that. Um, uh, certainly, uh, technology is very addictive. Uh, and I think he would agree agree that technology can be is very addictive it's like falling in love with yourself and uh you, you know not really uh recognizing that there's another uh world out there other possibilities um but i'm not sure that he's saying that we need to get rid of technology because of that um i think he's saying that we need to be careful uh and understand technology and that that would help us combat these issues that you're bringing up. Um, Doesn't he make the analogy that we are much like on a ship in a whirlpool and we're, we're, being, uh, we're floating on this technological whirlpool and by understanding that the medium is the, is the massage or the message, we will have greater control over our lives. Would that be true then? Is that what he's saying? I think he's saying that we need to understand how it works and that if we have an understanding of how it works, we can mitigate um, its influence on us. He also, and I'm going to talk about this later, is arguing that to um, focus on one technology, you know, in the 1960s, uh, television was the big thing. If you consume a lot of television, that is dangerous. Um, it's addictive. It can numb you. But you need to do something else as well. Because it's not just one medium that we have. We have multiple mediums out there. 
um, if we have a balance uh, of, of um, uh, how we consume media, you know, we consume television a little bit, but we also read books. We also watch movies. We also do other things, you know, um, we're, we're going to be more balanced ultimately. Okay. Thank you. Ron. And, and anyway, Tor Tori, thank you, uh, Sherman. That's, that's good. Uh, thanks, uh, Ronan. This has been great. Uh, very stimulating. Um, so I think I'm, I'm wondering if uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan's one of his, you know, paradoxes, or maybe it's one of his fallacies that in the Woody Allen movie, uh, was that his notion that the communication technologies wraps the world now together and creates lots of tribes and so on and so forth that there was going to be some kind of coherent consciousness mm. as a result of that. But what we're finding obviously mm -hmm. now is there's all kinds of conflict and discourse. Yeah. But I would say also to sort of John, I think it was John's point, your interlocutor there, yeah. uh, that uh, being too intellectual and analytical or something is somewhat of a vice, but it's the fact that or that participating in rationality was something only philosophers do or something, but actually it's not. F rationality itself is done in discourse. So yeah. to the point, to the extent that uh, we're interacting globally in all these discursive conversations and conflicts and arguments, and we're, we are actually as a society, as a, as a collective, we are, we, are, uh, we are being rational. Rationality is, a, a, is kind of a, uh, you know, a bruising sport, a combative sport. And that uh, finding that rationality, it's not, a, it's not a coherent consciousness that maybe Marshall yeah. McLuhan thought we were gonna have by this global brain. And by the way, as you know, other, other thinkers have recognized the coming of a global consciousness uh, as a result of technology. And just one last point is, um, you know, the technology, technology is not some exosomatic device, physical device. It's also part of the practice of the human to live a certain lifestyle. So it, it's, I'm of the belief that you can't separate uh, physical technology from how you're actually using it. And so as technology evolves, expands, uh, differentiates how we can live. Uh, there's there's a, a tremendous. It's there's a, a whole new practice of living that that's uh, that that's has an economic dimension to it. There, there's a tremendous amount of leverage in 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 how we you know create a livelihood and put food on the table and that kind of thing uh, as the te technology evolves. And and just the final point is that yes, it's right. It's all all. It's not communication is, is sort of the ultimate goal of all technology. So all technology, even farmers plows and things are sort of a result of um, or um, augmentation of better ways of doing things and communicating uh, uh, than previous ways of doing things. So, yeah, thank you. I, I, I would just very quickly comment um, to this uh, paradox that we're not moving toward a global consciousness. We're in fact uh, seeing a lot of uh, conflicts in the world. Um, and it's true. Um, I think that uh, one of the ironies of, of being in a kind of global environment uh, is that we're finding that people are forming um, technological cliques, um, right. um, also known as um, echo chambers, you know, where they kind of hear themselves. Uh, so to, to reference uh, Sherman's narcissist, it's a kind of uh, click, clicks based of, uh, on, on a kind of narcissistic approach to reality. Um, yeah. and, and this is a, a, a bad uh, thing, I think potentially has a, a bad sort of outcome. But, but I think that you're also right. I mean, um, technology allows us to extend uh, the dialectic uh, interactions that we have with one another. It allows us to see uh, things that we otherwise uh, would not see, meet people that we would otherwise not meet. Um, um, and, you know, with uh, uh, the, the coming of virtual reality and 
uh, augmented realities. Uh, we're eventually going to be able to travel, you know, to places and actually be in places virtually um, without even leaving our homes. And, and you know, what will that uh, bring about? Who knows? Yeah. Um, Rick, go ahead. Hi, Ronan. Uh, hey, Rick. First of all, a great talk, first of all. Thank you. I think M Marshall McLuhan would have loved the digital age because, first of all, you can adapt your devices to do just about anything you want to do. You can block things, you can censor things, you can uh, eliminate people you don't want to talk to, you can uh, put your settings on your phone, you can do so much to make life easier for you that uh, you're not stuck like with a with a book and you pass a book back and forth you can't really change what's on the written wor word it's what's there is there but with digital everything can be so changeable so uh personalized it makes it uh, much more effective and much uh easier to use in the end if you're smart enough about it and take the time to actually learn it yeah yeah, no, thank you, uh, Rick. I, I agree with that. Um, and again, I'm not a, I don't think the technology is a panacea, but it can do so much for us that um, I think ultimately will be more good than bad. But we have to be careful for it not to turn bad. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to um, say, let's hold the, the rest of the questions because I've got a few more things to say and, and we're coming close to almost the end it's like 8 30 so um would everybody be okay with that or do you want me to just ask the question let people ask their question and uh um whatever time we have we have um what do you think ala i would suggest go on with your presentation maybe okay. i'm sorry for the no. question people but i think we can give them floor after if you don't mind yeah okay so we'll do that so um ala is the person who, whose word I ultimately take. So we're gonna go on with the presentation uh, and then we'll come back to more questions. Allah uh, Akbar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll so. take it. Okay. Um, so let me uh, share the screen again. And uh, there we go. Okay. Let me just move on here. Okay, we had the discussion. Uh, I'm just gonna go very quickly through this hot versus cool uh, thing that he came up with. Um, this is an idea that is often quoted when discuss discussing McLuhan, you know, the idea of hot versus cool media. Um, frankly, this is an idea that I'm still trying to get my head around. It's a little bit confusing. Um, in essence, though, I'll give you the essence of it. In essence, what he is arguing is that cool media are low resolution and therefore require a high degree of audience participation. Okay, so certain media require you to uh, interact with it more. Uh, you can't just accept it passively. Whereas hot media are high resolution they give you lots of data and therefore require a low degree of participation. So cool media require a lot of participation, hot media require less participation. Um, here's a, a brief video with him explaining this. Uh, so I'm just gonna stop the um, PowerPoint and go on to the video. It's very quick, it's like a, a, a minute or so. Uh, let me just. Oh, I would like just to ask wrong. you about okay, the distinction that you draw between different kinds of media within the electric technology. Yes. You call some, such as television, cool, and some, such as radio, hot. Now, what does this mean? It um, has to do with the slang, uh, the slang phrase, the hot and the cool, which um, puzzles many people. Uh, the way it's used in slang uh, reverses the meaning of cool. Uh, cool in the slang form has come to mean involved. 
a deeply participative, deeply engaged. Everything that we had formerly meant by heated uh, uh, argument is now called cool uh, in slang. Cool, though the idea that cool uh, it has reversed its meaning, I think uh, has some bearing on the fact that our culture has shifted a, a good deal of its stress uh, into a um, demand that we be more committed, more involved in the situations in which we ordinarily work. And uh, a, a cool medium is one in which the, the definition is low and the audience has to work and supply yeah. the gaps. Well, well like medium, the cartoon, you see, that yes, we, like you were mentioning before, yeah, this is uh, real cool. Yes. Well, and, jazz, uh, as compared with classical music, is, uh, has many uh, of these aspects of uh, discontinuity and very much room for filling. Yes. But where the information or data level is low, uh, the fill-in or participation is high. If you fill the situation with complex data, uh, the uh, opportunity for completion fill-in is, is less and uh, participation is less. Okay. Um, so that's the uh, definition. Um, um, let me just... Uh, start the presentation again. Uh, okay, so um, this is an idea that I find a little bit uh, confusing, especially if you try to apply it to specific media. Um, here's a little bit of a chart on um, hot versus cool mediums. So a hot medium extends single, a single sense in high definition, uh, it's slow in audience participation. It engenders specialization and fragmentation. It detribalizes and it excludes. So examples of hot medium include things like photographs, radio, phonetic alphabet, print, uh, a lecture, film, books. A cool medium is low definition, there's less data, it's high in audience participation, it engenders holistic patterns, it tribalizes and it includes. And examples of cool medium are things like cartoons, the telephone, ideographic and pictographic writing, speech, uh, orality, seminars, discussions, television and comics. Now, I know that we can have probably a two hour debate on whether this is a reasonable uh, kind of uh, categorization. And I don't wanna do that. Um, I'm just gonna say that this hot versus school, the concept I understand, I think that some of the uh, categories may not work quite well. For example, television is cool. Oh, television is cool according to Marshall McLuhan. And, and this is an important point I should, I should mention before we move on. Something can be cool today, but it can heat up. It can heat up. Television, I think he would say, is actually more of a hot medium today than it was um, in his day. So in his day, television tended to be black and white. It tended to be very low resolution. Uh, it tended to be watched on a very small screen. Um, it tended to be watched by a group of people together. Um, so it tended towards being cool. There is not a lot of data that came at you from uh, early televisions, but today, Television is definitely, I, I think, heated up because there's so much data coming at you from televisions, uh, you know, stereo, sound, uh, you know, eight, uh, uh, you know, 4K video, sometimes even 8K video we're moving towards. So there's a lot of data. So it's a lot hotter now than it used to be. Um, okay, so let's move on uh, from this. You can uh, talk about it more during the discussion uh, part of the, uh, 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 that we'll, we'll have in a minute. Um, now, I was gonna talk about Marshall McLuhan's son, Eric McLuhan, who published a book called Laws of Media. 
um, where he uh, conceived of the tetrad. And I'm not going to go through this because I don't have the time. Uh, I will put this on the website. If you're interested, you can go look it up. Uh, it's an interesting way of uh, thinking about the evolution of media. So it's kind of what he calls the laws of the tetrad. And he believes it highlights uh, a certain law in terms of how the media evolves over time. But I'm not going to go over it because we don't have the time. But I do want to finish this off by talking about McLuhan as a, uh, a moralizer or not a moralizer. Um, overall, McLuhan was not a mor moralizer. In fact, he refused to take moral positions uh, about technology. Even though he was a devout Catholic and he apparently read the Bible every day. Uh, his private morality did not let him influence his scholarship. Uh, a common answer that he would give to any question about the value of one type of media over another is that to moralize about media is detrimental to knowledge. Do not moralize about media. Intellectually, he said it's questionable because a moral point of view too often serves as a substitute for understanding in technical matters. Um, I'm not going to read this. It's a lot. Uh, but I am going to read uh, this, which is really interesting. And it's uh, a quotation from a interview he gave to Playboy. Um, so he, he said, for many years, until I wrote my first book, The Mechanical Bride, I adopted an extremely moralistic approach to all environmental technology. And by env environmental technology, he meant technology that changes our environment, the environment that we live in. Um, he didn't mean natural environment. He didn't mean environmental change the way we talk about it now. He just meant the environment in which we um, live in. Uh, I loathed machinery. I abominated cities. I equated the Industrial Revolution with original sin and mass media with the fall. In short, I rejected almost every element of modern life in favor of a Rousseauian utopianism. But gradually, I perceived how sterile and useless this attitude was, and I began to realize that the greatest artists of the 20th century, Yeats, Pound, Joyce, Eliot, had discovered a totally different approach based on the identity of the processes of cognition and creation. I realized that artistic creation is the playback of ordinary experience from trash to treasure. I ceased being a moralist and became a student. The world we are living in is not one I would have created on my own drawing board, but it's the one in which I must live and in which the students I teach must live. If nothing else, I owe it to them to avoid the luxury of moral indignation or the troglodytic security of the ivory tower and to get down into the junkyard of environmental change and steam shovel my way through a comprehension of its contents and its lines of force in order to understand how and why it is metamorphosing man. Cataclysmic environmental changes are in and of themselves morally neutral. It is how we perceive them and react to them that will determine their ultimate psychic and social consequences. So, despite his refusal to moralize and pass past value judgments on media, McLuhan was well aware that the power of certain media can be addictive. For example, TVs, smartphones, YouTube, Netflix, they have a narcotic effect. They potentially can have a narcotic type effect. In fact, one of the reasons I, I think that he wrote understanding media is to warn us about the effects of media that we are ignoring. We're ignoring the effects of media. So while he doesn't pass judgment on media, because each media affects us differently, 
they all have value, but they all have dangers. What he seems to believe is that there is an antidote to media's addictive nature. And the antidote is really simple. It's awareness, being aware. By being aware of the effect media have on us, we can be in a better position to counteract them. In his own words, he says, it is the theme of this book that not even the most lucid understanding of the peculiar force of a medium can head off the ordinary closure of the senses that causes us to conform to the pattern of experience presented. To resist TV, there, to resist TV therefore one must acquire the antidote of related media like print. He says here, it is true that it's not enough to understand something. Uh, it's still going to affect us. I can understand the influence the TV has on me, but I can still get addicted to it. The real answer is to not just watch TV, to counter act TV by reading a book, by knowing that you need to turn off the TV and do something else. So basically, an antidote to the numbing effect of any particular medium is to use another medium that has a counter effect. This is in his own words. When the technology of a time is powerfully thrusting in one direction, Wisdom may well call for a countervailing thrust. So basically, turn off the TV or the computer or the smartphone or whatever and do something else like read a book, go out for breakfast with friends and have vigorous chats, make something, perhaps your own media. For example, make a YouTube video because making media, for example, a YouTube video is different from consuming media. It's still media, but it interacts with your senses in a very different way than consuming media. Again, McLuhan is arguing that a cure for the effects of any dominant medium or pattern of the time can be a countervailing force in the opposite direction of the dominating force. Another way, he says, to deal with the numbing effect of media, and this is something he referenced in the quotation that I read, the Playboy quotation, is to assume the attitude of the artist. Assume the attitudes of the artist. He says, the effects of technology do not occur at the level of opinion or concepts but alter sense ratios or patterns of perception steadily and without any resistance. The serious artist is the only person able to counter and counter technology with impunity just because he is an expert, he is an expert aware of the changes in sense perception. So to take an artistic approach is to basically um, analyze media um, by virtue of using concepts. Don't just consume them. Interact with media. Don't be a passive consumer of media. Have an artistic kind of relationship to media. So an artist is anyone who engages in insightful analysis and tries to understand the un underlying life of forms and structures created by electric technology. So an artist is a person uh, who has integral awareness. Again, he writes, the artist is the man in any field, scientific or humanistic, who grasps the implications of his actions and of new knowledge in his time. He is the man of integral awareness. So finally, one more quote, and then we can continue uh, with a discussion for the remaining time. It is not an exaggeration to say 
that the future of modern society and the stability of its inner life depend in large part on the maintenance of an equilibrium between the strength of the techniques of communication and the capacity of the individual's own reaction. Okay, now I'm going to uh, stop here, but I do want to say that um, um, one of uh, uh, McLuhan's followers is a uh, uh, theorist, uh, communication theorist and, and a historian by the name of Neil Postman. And he's written some amazing books that I highly recommend uh, about technology and media and how they influence us. He's more dystopian than McLuhan. Uh, I was gonna talk a little bit about him, there's no time, but I recommend that you, if you have a chance, uh, get the book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, which I have uh, right here. And it's an amazing, uh, oh, sorry, this is Technopoly. Technopoly and Amusing Ourselves to Death. They're both uh, great books uh, and I highly recommend them, okay? So I don't have Amusing Ourselves to Death here. I do have the book, I couldn't find it. It's been a while since I, I read it, uh, but they're both uh, amazing books and um, highly recommended. Okay, so uh, let's uh, open up the floor now for, for discussion. And I'm gonna let John uh, be the first to just make a quick point and then I'll open up the floor to everybody else. Uh, let me just stop sharing here and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, continue. Or John, where are you? I'm right here. Oh, you okay, there we go. Oh, we've got yeah, it on. Yeah. Okay, speaker. Yeah, well, well okay. yeah, well, uh, Ronan uh, Maximus, I'm yeah. glad. That, that those last few slides that you came clean yes about about the, the, how you feel about technology <clears throat> and i've come to have the very same view as you through our discussions that it's a lot to expect of us to be able to have uh, the ability to, to discern the messages and the mediums the way that we've been bombarded at us but like you say they're just simply turn them off yeah and uh you know i i kind of think like uh you know, the mass amount of uh, mediums and messages are, in my opinion, having a profound effect on people. M McLuhan would, would agree. But, uh, like, it, having a profound effect, like, on what the Buddhists call our sixth sense, which is our mind. I think our sixth sense is our mind. And uh, it, that mind is in conflict and can create a lot of psychosis when it's trying to deal with all this barrage of mediums and uh, messages. And, you know, uh, we're being denatured, like uh, Jack London would say. I think it's really happening to a lot of people. Not to you, Ronan, right? I mean, you grew up with the toll mood and the, and, and the Torah. The toll mood is a real reasoning, rational, kind of existential way to live life. And it's taught you how to, it teaches people how to think and therefore not to be overwhelmed by technologies and, uh, and mediums and messages because you've just got a, you've got a ground, grounded base in rationality. Not all people do. And uh, I guess this is where I move into that more dystopian Neil Postman thing that we have to be maybe more aware, but McLuhan is admitting it here. We've got to figure it out. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's all I'm saying is uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, a it's much more of a struggle for, 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 for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, I see it. Thank and you, John. I think, I think, I think we're we got to be careful. Yeah. We're, we're ultimately seeing, I think, uh, eye to eye in, in, in yeah. for the most part. Um, okay, uh, Sherman, go ahead. Go ahead, Sherman. Uh, you 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 got to unmute. You, uh, ask, you got to unmute. So I would like to talk about briefly about McLuhan's uh, Catholicism. And so in the early 1950s, uh, he read Etienne Gilson's books mm -hmm. uh, deeply. He was uh, very aware of Gilson's perspective on uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas and yeah. uh, metaphysics and so on. But by the late 50s, he was re reading Lonergan. Mm -hmm. And 
well, our whole point of Lottergan's book is the idea of insight. And sometimes I thought that on reading McLuhan's books, uh, it does seem to represent a compilation of insights mm -hmm. gathered on our material culture. Yeah. And then upon evaluating our material culture, we had these insights into the communication system. And thereafter, we would have some conceptualization, maybe some metaphysical system, a way of understanding uh, our communication media. So there isn't a great deal written about uh, McLuhan and Lonergan, but if you look at uh, McLuhan's introduction to uh, Harold Innes' book, Empire yeah. and Communications, uh, it's just like reading Lonergan, where he talks about Innes' ideas of a, a series of insights in the uh, communication system. That's all. I just want to bring that. Yeah, no, absolutely. He, he was heavily influenced by Harold Innes and Lonergan and uh, uh, really respected their writing. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and again, I don't have a lot of knowledge on this because I haven't done all the reading uh, really on that, but it's definitely a wonderful place to go to and to find the, the influence that they had on him. Um, and of course, Harold Innes had his own um, uh, sort of uh, theory of communication technology and, um, you know, a more anthropological sort of approach to it, as I understand it. Um, it's all very interesting, but it's, it's a lot. Um, yeah, it is. It is a lot. A very good presentation, Ronan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sherman. Uh, Aaron, you're next. Aaron? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to kind of go over some of the ideas I, I guess I need some input on it if if any if anybody's even uh, able if we have the time but sort of just the idea of um, kind of the medium is destroying a culture um, and then the idea of sort of regressing uh, instead of kind of pushing and, and progressing technology um, and I, I think it's I think it's important to sort of, um, recognize that uh, technology is, is sort of instilled uh, within uh, not just humans. I, I don't think we invented technology. For example, many invertebrates uh, such as octopi would um, sort of find things at the bottom of the sea and use them as sort of closure or use them as tools themselves or, or even have kind of turf wars. Um, and, and so I, I guess that's sort of the ocean and the fish um, in my eyes. Um, and, then, and then I don't really see the point uh, then again in, in moralizing it, if we're gonna compare that with the whole TV aspect. And that in that final quote, there was the whole maintenance and equilibrium portion. Mm -hmm. Then I, I, I sort of think then that um, if we're not if we're not looking to regress, or we're not looking to pro or halt the technological progression, uh, then uh, this is sort of the mitigation. Uh, these are sort of the things that we are taking, uh, whether it be in part of your own responsibility to kind of counteract the negative effects of technology, um, or perhaps solve those negative issues with new technology. Um, I think it's important to sort of continue to progress. Yeah, no, and, and you know, uh, somebody pointed out at the beginning of the uh, presentation when we had our little uh, discussion that um, uh, with uh, technology now, we are abnegating our identity. We're abnega abnegating our uh, privacy. We're, we're giving up a lot of things and, and it's true. Um, so, with any technology, with any powerful technology, we're going to get into a situation where it can potentially harm us. I think McLuhan is ultimately saying um, that we need to understand it and we need to control it. If we don't, it will control us. And how do we control it? We control it by teaching it properly in school, by not worrying about the content because the content is incidental worry about the underlying structure and, and learn uh, what it's all about. And then you will be able to deal with it 
both the positive and negative sides of technology. Um, anyway, uh, Stella, your turn. Finally. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say how obviously coming from it from a point of view of someone who's never lived without a lot of the technology that I'm sure you guys have had lives without. Um, and it's been interesting for me personally as a teenager having a baby boomer dad to see the way that he interacts with technology versus my mother who's of gen x versus me like we span well as many generations as three people can span um and i do think it's interesting how each one of us interact with technology differently and obviously what that's to be expected from three individual unique people but also it does i do think it does have to do with our generation too quite a bit um but I also just wanted to say that um, I do think it still comes down to the individual big time and how we interact with technology and what we think we can and cannot be done. And um, my phone would let me in. Um, I, speaking of technology, I wanted to read a quote <laughs> from one of my favorite writers, but I'm not, this is not going to happen. Please let me in. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just, I, when we, when I think about technology and my relationship to it, I think about um, an Emma Goldman quote that I really like, and she said, changes wrought by, by machine intervention are, com are completely on the external side and leave the real battle, which has to be fought from within the person. And I really, I really like that quote because I think in such a short, in such a short statement, it does really, it does really sort of sum up a lot of both what we've been talking about and also um, the just the vast majority of, of people do let things that are external infect, affect them internally and that's sort of part of the human condition and being alive but also I think the more we incorporate technology in our lives the more likely we are to have it become something that feels internal um, rather than external and I think we often forget that and then sometimes it can be easier and harder depending on your age. For instance, I've noticed that a lot of people my age are, are in some ways more attached to their technology than older generations because older generations haven't had it their whole lives. But in other ways, older generations are more captivated by it, whereas younger generations tend to be a little bit more um, like this, is, this has been around all my life. I've noticed that people 40, 50, 60, 70 are way more into technology in the sense that it's still like this really interesting thing to them, which can actually be a curse to them because it is so interesting and new to them still. They feel like they have to be using it all the time almost to catch up, like it's a competition. Um, and I even feel like that sometimes because I'm by far not a very tech savvy person compared to um, a lot of people I know. And a lot of older people are like, well, you just, you just have the advantage of being young. So you know, like just by definition, a lot more. And I don't think that goes away with time because like anything that can be learned, like technology is something that requires a lot of learning and a lot of learning that we're both willing to do and not willing to do. Like I'm not willing to spend a huge large part of my life learning how to do things on my computer that I will not serve me. However, I am willing to take some time to learn how to pirate books well because I really enjoy reading books and I don't want to pay for every book that I want to read. Um, you know, so it depends. It's also this like pick and choose of like what, what yeah. in the same way with physical things and learning physical things, like how badly do you want to be able to sew things? Where are you willing to put in the time to do that? But at the same yeah. time, it's also not fair because we're not given we're not given all equal access to technology and to learn it either, or the same amount of time to learn it. So it does con continue disparities that are already prevalent in society as yeah. well. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn with technology. And um, you, you say you choose what uh, you're going to use because it serves you well. You don't just blindly follow it. You, you really are uh, very careful about it. And that's because you're a thoughtful person and um you know you admitted to pirating books and it brings up a whole different uh issue around technology which is of course the issue of copyright and and uh, you know what does it mean to actually have a digital copy of something is it real you know it 
I think brings up ontological questions of, uh, of, of being and reality and, and metaphysical questions. And these are questions we didn't even touch on uh, today, but they're fascinating questions, uh, perhaps for future discussions. Anyway, Michael, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um... Yeah, I, I think we can learn as much as we want, but I still I feel it's kind of like a self-satisfaction uh, uh, games, you know. Uh, whatever you learn, whatever you do, you, you, I mean, pretty the same. You could, I mean, you would look at the past, you know, right? we don't think like we are much smarter than the past uh, in the, you know, generation. Um, but I mean, that's a, but what I want to say is like, if technology develop in that way, so based on the, the the technology because you say extension by the mouth by the by the thinking by the by the vision so that doesn't mean if technology technology can collect all the behavior of human beings uh, could they technology can simulate another person so they know what the individual person they want to do that means that if we involve like a power in the society so that kind of like, uh, you know, in the mechanical, we call element of finite, finite uh, element, uh, element, elementary finite. Uh, we can simulation, you know, the, 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 the car, the, you know, I, technology can do this. I think technology can simulate the behavior of human beings. I mean, for the individual point of view, that impact. From society point of view, what I say is, uh, in the current lay, the society is, is vertical, like a pyramid, right? The top, middle class, and the bottom line. So if a technology involved the power in, could it be become in the future is kind of a parallel, parallelism. That means uh, the top, the middle, and the bottom line, they completely separate. Uh, that is kind of like a society impact. So I just want to mention, I mean, I just want to raise like two questions. One is for the individual person impact, Another is that for the, if technology is involved, power, public, the society become from pyramid to the paro, parallel, uh, you know, the models. So that's... Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, you brought up another interesting uh, question there, Michael, around um, how technology might simulate uh, uh, individuals, uh, human beings. Um, if I understand you, I think you're talking a, a little bit about artificial intelligence and, you know, the potential that artificial intelligence has to um, affect um, how we interact with technology. Uh, you know, if you think of, of technology like Google Home, which is, is it's in be, its infancy. Be, because um, currently the, the application, they do that. You know, the YouTube, yeah. they propose the things you, you, you want to see. That's you know, right. Bookshop uh, and whatever, they, they try right. to do that. That's right. And, and so um, as technologies become more intelligent, um, that's something we have to be aware of. Um, but of course, it also has a lot of positive, but again, negative as well, because we don't want to be inundated with, uh, uh, you know, advertising and stuff because a technology has an algorithm that understands us mm -hmm. and that's that's basically no, stealing no. our identity so we have to be careful about it no. um it's true but it's just part of the evolution of technology and that's what McLuhan is uh saying uh as well that technologies tend to flip so computer technology where we have to input information will eventually flip into something where you know we don't have to input any information uh, it will, you know, have the ability to self-replicate and to to create its own algorithms and, uh, you know, um, interact with us in ways that uh, is very natural. Um, and that's, again, a double-edged sword. It's, it's dangerous. But I can imagine if you're all alone, lonely at home, and you have nobody, but you can get a technology that can actually converse with you intelligently, maybe that's a good thing. You know, it keeps you company. And, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Randy. Uh, sorry, for the society, could it be in, 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 into the parallel uh, from pyramid to change the parallel? Mm. I'm not sure I follow that argument, Michael. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it. If somebody else understands that um, argument that Michael is putting forward, maybe you can respond to it. Uh, 
Uh, Michael, can you uh, write it down in the uh, chat and um, uh, then I can respond to it because I'm not sure I followed the argument. Um, so if you can write it down, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Randy. Great presentation, Ron, and really enjoyed it. Um, and this, uh, this comment will come as no surprise to you, but I would argue that the greatest impact on technology is our standard of living. Communication and energy is a fundamental part of growth in the economy. So uh, McLuhan has addressed how we respond to the technology on a personal level, but the actual impact of the technology is the growth of our economy. And that's, that creates the circumstance that we're, we're actually reacting to. And that just doesn't seem to be addressed. Of course, I don't think he was an economist, so I suspect that's probably why it wasn't. So I would just say that is the overwhelming impact of technology in general. As I said, I, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you, that, that comment coming from me. So I, I'm just wanting, wanting to flesh it out a little bit. Are you saying that um, economic prosperity influences how we use technology or it influences our ability to acquire technology um, well, it actually it actually creates the culture where we, we are responding to, and and the technology that we're using to respond to that is sort of a byproduct of the growth that technology has achieved for us. At least that's the argument I'm making, and we seem to be dealing with the individual and how we're reacting. The media, the media <laughs> is the message hmm. on how it's going to how we're going to react to that, but. How we're going to react to that is, is really largely governed by the economic circumstance that we're mm -hmm. reacting within. It is a bit of a circuitous argument, uh, to say the least. But, but the, the big the big issue with technology is what it has done to our economic growth. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that there's a difference between the the micro effects, which is the, to, to the individual, and the macro effects, which is more um, economic. Uh, effects that lead to prosperity. I mean, technology has a ubiquitous effect on economic growth. There's no doubt about that. Um, it also has an impact on the kind of jobs that people do. Um, the way technology evolves leads to um, people sometimes losing jobs, um, acquiring different types of jobs. It, increases productivity. Um, it does all sorts of things that lead to um, economic prosperity. I, I would say uh, possibly more than not, not prosperity. So um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I don't know that, yeah, McLuhan was not interested so much in that as far as I know. At least I haven't come across a lot of uh, stuff that he wrote that have to do with like the macro effects of technology. You know, it'd be very difficult to define. There's no question about that. But the tensions we're seeing in society today may well have to do with a, a, a much greater disparity between the wealthy and the less wealthy. Sure. Which is a byproduct of our technological change. Sure. And that's the economic circumstance that now we're responding to through this media, this mass media. Sure. Uh, it is a circular argument to, to be sure. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That's that's why the government is constantly pushing for um, high bandwidth across the country for everybody, because having internet, having access to technology, um, is uh, part and parcel of prosperity. People who don't have access to technology tend not to have access to prosperity. Well, look, look at the Zoom we're on right now. I mean, mm -hmm. we're using this as a personal means of communication. But by far, the, the major impact was been uh, on business. What yeah. happened during COVID? Business was all on Zoom yeah. or sitting people at home. So, so that, that's uh, the type of technology that actually changes the fundamental structure of our society. For sure. For sure. Thank yeah, you, no, I agree with, really I agree with completely. No, yeah. Thanks a lot, Ron. It was great. And John, yeah, thank thanks. you. Thanks, Randy. Hey, Ronan, can uh, I make a little announcement that yeah. probably Torres already ha has uh, raised his hand, so yeah. Tor, you're going to be the last one for tonight, and I want to say thank you to everyone, and especially to you, Ronan, for doing that. Thank you for and, listening, everybody. Oh, it was a pleasure. So, but just 
let me remind you, this is going to be posted on YouTube. And anyone who wants to say something and didn't have an opportunity, please go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, and we have a comment section. And you can put it like a maybe discussion and writing if you want to share our your thoughts with us. So um, that's that's it. And OK, maybe Tori, you can go now. Thank you. Um, just quickly, but it's actually kind of a big point that since this is a philosophy uh, club and, and institute, I think the point that needs to be made is that technology is ontologically inseparable from practices, human practices. So there, there's no such thing as, as a technology that's separate from people using the technology and uh the the uh, the commercial system and the business system of industrialization is constantly building new technologies relying on science to create new 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 technologies um but that it leads to a division of labor in all kinds of fields that um, are are communicating are doing different practices around their own proximate technologies of work, and so the modern era of industrialization is uh, constituted by a whole bunch of tribes who have different practices, you know, professions and trades and classes of you know bourgeois people. Uh, where we relate to our tools that our industrial system pr provides. So um, I think that, but it, it leads to this, this modern way of life. And I think, Emil, you know, back to Graham Hubb's point that Rousseau pointed out, there's these sort of transitions from, you know, luxury items to necessities. Adam Smith picked up on that. He has three, three categories luxury necessity conveniences and, and necessities and as as we de the human race develops all these new technologies the, the standard of living goes up but we're also producing those technologies as as uh, occupations so it's not a circular argument uh as somebody else had said it's it's this cumulative uh path dependent way of of our uh practices leading to the incrementally next technological breakthrough and uh there you know there there's there's kind of a uh there are no absolute standards in that development for one thing but uh you know as, as we have you've been saying and marshall McLuhan, you know we we not only create technology but technology creates us it's that that inseparability between the thing of a, any particular technological thing and the practice of using that thing those are not separable ontologically so it's it's a way of life that we are entering in the in the modern age emil durkheim i think has made some great points that once we get out of religion and a lot of these sort of normalizing belief systems in in society and we get into these discrete occupational groups that are all doing sort of their own tribal norms we we face a whole new situation in, in history where you know we're so technologically separated that there's 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 that lack of coherence that the old religions used to give us so um that's 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 part of the problem we have tremendous leverage we have a high standard of living but we're we're quite uh uh you know anomic or without norms uh to go by so uh you know best, yeah I, I, the best thing we can do is is pay plagiarize books that like uh stella was talking about here's a great book i think of uh some economists right there in york university uh capitalist power jonathan nitson and uh shimson meichler that you can download for free uh, be yeah. very good uh, reading, I think, for this group. And yeah, those are my... no, but no, they're, they're great points. Um, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's ontologically just a part of uh, who we are. 
uh, and and it's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, makes us in some way as well as as we make it, um, and it uh, is is something that uh, uh, becomes I wouldn't say a necessity, but just a reality. It's just it's there. Um, so you know, Graham was talking about how you know we have something that is created and, and it's okay it's a it's a thing that you know is uh, uh, a part of our lives but we don't need it but eventually it becomes something that we do need um, and I, I think that technology works like that uh, it, it evolves and uh, it penetrates us in ways that um, we find it very very difficult to live without it and uh the reason we find it very difficult is because I think it ultimately makes life better. But as McLuhan says, any technology also has the potential to make life worse. And, and that's where human consciousness and awareness need to play a huge part. Uh, and by the way, I, I did listen to a, a talk by Eric McLuhan, and he did say that we're not there. You know, he, he says, you know, technology is uh, not being taught well at school. It was a thing I heard on YouTube. He was talking to somebody about technology and the medium and how it's taught. And he says, we still focus too much on the content and we don't really teach um, um, media uh, studies in, in ways that are actually um, uh, uh, insightful enough to to make a change into into how we inter interact with technology anyway thank you thank you everybody it was uh, really a pleasure to to do this and thank you for yeah. listening yeah um, yeah thank you very much ronan john and everybody Allah and everybody it, yes it was an excellent excellent john uh, thank you for being my nemesis i appreciate it Uh, no, I can't hear you, John. John, unmute, please. No, you got to unmute, John. You got to unmute. You got to unmute, John. You, come on, learn how to use the technology, John. John the Luddite. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a magnificent response from John. <laughs> he refuses to use the technology. Well done. <clears throat> Okay, everybody. Thank you. I guess we're going to call it a night for tonight. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to make one quick comment to you, Ronan, about technology. I think it's really interesting because for me, I use technology in a large part to connect with um, the past for me, just because I'm such a big nerd for history that like, it's really, I really a lot of times think about the irony of the fact that I'm, for instance, I have a friend who's who's, you know, very good at um, uploading. So everything that, you know, we watch can be in like one place that we can save to then go back to instead of having to find a source, a way to get the, the thing again after you've already done it. Um, so I'll put mainly like obscure films that are hard for me to find again on hmm. there. And sure. I also always think how funny that is to me that I'm like, okay, I'm watching this film from, you know, 1927 that I think is really cool. And I'm, you know, nerding out over it, but I'm watching it on a flat screen TV and I'm, and I'm streaming it from my computer. <laughs> and it's, yeah. you know, this digitally like um, digitized version of this film reel from almost a hundred years ago or something, or the same thing I went with my parents last night to, it's called Silent Movie Mondays and a really pretty old theater here um, for a couple months does silent movies on Monday and they're doing mm -hmm. women this whole month for Women's History Month. And I went last night and it played two Lois Weber films um, from 1913 and 1916, I think respectively. And it was, and it was really cool because they had, they had the whole, the, um, they had it all um, pieced back together um, especially because the the film had eroded in parts, so they they took they took other shots from some of our other films to to um, fill in a little bit, and also they just left parts of it unfinished. And I thought it was really cool. And even though they didn't have the actual reel playing, they brought out the old organ that was from that time period to have it be playing at the same time. And I was like, this is interesting. So we don't have the actual reel. So the part that I'm viewing is modern, even though it's from a film from over a hundred years ago yet 
the music I'm listening to is pretty authentic to what I would have been. I would have been listening to the same thing a hundred years mm. ago had I been sitting yeah. here with my so parents. And, Stella, you know, I, I, Stella, I want to ask you to report back to us in approximately 55 years time. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, and uh, like I, um, I, I, I can remember like what the, what the world was like. You know, when I was uh, seventeen, TV was black and white, for example, right? So, so please report back, as I say, in fifty five years' time as to the change. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to do that. You'll you'll be how old again? <laughs> oh, I'll be like you know, hundred. I'll be like Methuselah. I, I do plan to live that long. <laughs> you know. Okay. Thanks, Ronan. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.